So a lot of you can probably recognize this and relate to this experience where, you know, irrational, some of the most rational people come up with very irrational arguments, these justifications to continue eating animals. So it's, it's really important to become aware of carnism when we're advocating a change toward a more plant-based or vegan diet or lifestyle. Um, and it's also important because it's important to know the mentality of the people we're communicating with and reaching out to. And it's also important to help non-vegans recognize this psychology when we become aware of these sort of carnistic defense mechanisms, um, they lose much of their power over us. When people become aware of the way they've been conditioned specifically to think and, and feel and act in ways that support carnism, a system that runs counter to, to what they probably um, you know, would likely choose to support if they were more aware, they're much less likely to continue supporting the system. So now let's talk about you know, uh, our second question, which is you know, how, how can we bypass this resistance? The first and probably most important thing um, to, to talk about or to think about when we're communicating, so when we're talking about bypassing resistance, we're talking about communicating, communicating in a way, right, that increases the chances that our message will be heard as we intend it to be heard. And it's important that we focus less on the content than on the process of our communication. All communication has these two parts. The content is what we're communicating about, and the process is how we're communicating. The process matters more, but most people tend to focus more on the content. Um, think about, for example, a conversation that you had, just imagine a conversation you had maybe six months ago, maybe a year ago, maybe it was like at a party, out to dinner with people. It's possible that you have entirely forgotten the content. You don't even remember what you talked about, but probably you still remember how you felt in that conversation. The process determines how we feel. When our process is healthy, we can talk about just about anything without arguing. When our process is unhealthy, we can't talk about anything without arguing. When our process is healthy, that means our goal in a conversation is not to be right, which means to make the other person wrong. And our goal is not to win, which means to make the other person lose. Our goal is mutual understanding. Our, the reason that we communicate in the first place is simply because we're not telepathic. Um, so our goal is to communicate the truth of our experience, our thoughts and our feelings, and to understand the truth of the other person's or people's experience. This is um, really important to think about or to be aware of when we're talking about sensitive issues such as eating or not eating animals. Typically, debate, debating doesn't work. The debate model is effective in only specific types of situations. Um, maybe in a courtroom, for example, when somebody is running for political office. When we start getting into debate mode, when we debate somebody and start trying to convince them of the rightness of what we're trying to say and invite them to debate with us, we're basically inviting them, you know, the goal of a debate is to win. When we invite somebody into a debate, we're inviting them to come up with all of the reasons that they can come up with in order to prove the rightness of their own position, in order to win the debate and prove that eating animals is the right thing to do. Studies have shown that the more people look for uh, evidence that supports their current perspective, the more entrenched they become in this perspective. When we invite somebody into a debate, we invite them to look for reasons to continue eating animals. So when our uh, process is healthy, our goal is mutual understanding. We remember that underneath the differences and <clears throat> perhaps our ideologies, um, our approaches, you know, underneath these differences, is a relationship between people and that's where the focus needs to be. So we discuss rather than debate. <clears throat> we can't force people to change, but we can communicate in a way that increases the likelihood that we'll be open, that they will be open to our message so that if and when they're ready to change, they will. 
So really effectively advocating anything is not about changing hearts and minds, it's about opening hearts and minds, creating an environment where people will be open to our message. So don't expect the facts to sell the ideology. Facts matter, there's no question. But very often <clears throat> people hear the facts and they don't change. I'm sure that many of you listening to me talking right now can relate to what I'm saying. So often those of us who are vegan, for example, think that when we're talking to non-vegan, if only you knew the truth about eating animals, the capital T, you would never eat them again. And they, this person learns the truth and then they're at the McDonald's drive through the next day and we're thinking like, oh my God, what's wrong with you? Um, what we really need to do is to focus on just plant seeds, just plant seeds. Don't expect that you're going to, you tell people the facts, they're suddenly going to change. What we need to do is to share, and I'm going to talk about specifically how to do this to plant seeds, to share pieces of information in a way that creates a more receptive atmosphere. Because really, at the end of the day, when we're advocating, you know, a move toward a plant-based or a vegan lifestyle, you know, what we're advocating is moral consistency, we're advocating health, we're advocating, you know, a more just uh, relationship with food, we're ad ad advocating compassion. Um, we are advocating for the very things that most people genuinely do care about and want. It's just a question of bypassing these carnistic defenses and communicating in a way that help people hear our message the way that we intend it to be heard and not become so defensive and distort what we're saying. <clears throat> when you communicate, it's a good idea to do so through sharing your own story. Um, you know, this is a picture of me and my dog Fritz um, back in, this was taken when I was, I think, four years old in 1970. And I, when, when somebody says to me, for example, oh, so, you know, why are you vegan? Why are you plant-based? You know, why are you vegan? I don't respond with all the reasons they should be vegan. Well, you know, animal agriculture is a leading cause of climate change and, and, and animal exploitation. I respond by answering the question they actually asked, which is why am I vegan? Nobody can make your story wrong. This way you avoid shooting. And when people feel shoulded, when they feel like you're trying to change them, this is when the wall starts to go up. So you share your story, keep it short, and keep it on point and ideally speak to their interests if you can. So if somebody says, why are you vegan? I say, well, first I start by saying, well, for much of my life, I ate animals actually to, to really you know, show that I do remember what it was like not to be vegan. Um, I haven't developed what Tobias Lehner, my colleague calls vegan amnesia. I grew up with a dog, you know, like a family member. And I also grew up eating meat, eggs and dairy. And, um, you know, for so much of my life, I never thought about how strange it was that I could pet my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other. Pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent and, and sentient as my dog. Um, but then one day I ate a contaminated hamburger, had Campylobacter in it, and I got really sick and I never wanted to eat meat again. And as I was learning about how to cook for myself, you know, but vegetarian diet back in the 80s, um, I stumbled upon information about animal agriculture. And what I learned shocked and horrified me. And I just realized that I, I was really surprised by what I had learned. And I realized that I didn't want to participate in that anymore. Um, and if I'm talking to somebody who's really interested in health, for example, I'll throw in and I'm healthier today at 54 than I was when I was half my age. Um, so share your story, not your entire journey necessarily, keep it short, but make it about you. It's also important to know when not to advocate, when not to talk um, in order to raise awareness of the issue. Sometimes, you know, if you're that person, you're a vegan or you're, you know, on a, on a, a full plant-based diet, you just want to go to like a family dinner or you want to go to a party and you want to be you. You don't want to be a spokesperson for an entire social movement. Um, and it's really important to honor that because people who are committed to these issues that are really critical critical issues to be committed to in our world are also people who typically are at high risk of burning out because 
advocating, you know, being a representative for these issues, being an ambassador. It's like the job that you never get to log off from at the end of the day. You feel like you constantly, you always have to be on, always have to be, you know, very often we can feel tokenized and we have to be perfect representations of the movement or the issue we're rep representing. Some of you might um, relate to the, the feeling of, you know, trying to hide from others when you have a head cold because you're afraid that your sniffles are gonna lead them to conclude that it's because of your diet. See, there it is. I knew you were nutrient deficient, right? When the guy next door who just had quadruple bypass heart surgery just has bad genetics. So a lot of times we just feel like we're carrying the weight of this movement and of this cause on our shoulders. And it's really important for our own sustainability to know when to step back and not ad to advocate. And you know, when you give yourself permission not to be that perfect ambassador, that advocate and representative, you invest in your own longevity as somebody who is representing a very important social cause. And that longevity is more important than you know, seizing every possible opportunity to raise awareness. And also, you know, there are unfortunately nearly 8 billion people in the world today. Many of them are not ready to move toward a plant-based or vegan diet, um, and, and many of them are. So don't advocate to people who actually say, I don't care, or who seem really resistant to the message because that's exhausting and not a great use of time. And there are plenty of people who really are the low-hanging fruit and really are open to this message and to changing.